Thanks for checking out the weekly sermon from Church of the Resurrection. I pray that God will use this message to speak to you and help you grow in your faith journey. If you're in the KC area, I'd like to invite you to join us next week at one of our services or join us in live worship online at core.org worship. Church of the Resurrection is one church in multiple locations. To learn more about the service times and our ministries, please visit core.org. Hope you enjoy this week's message. As we continue in worship, I invite you to hear these words of scripture. Our first passage today comes from the prophet Micah. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. And from the gospels, the angel said to Mary, Your son will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Jesus came into Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. Jesus said to his disciples, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in the book of Revelation we read, He has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. Today, thanks to the gift of technology and the necessities of COVID, I'm having a chance to preach in two places at the same time. I'm thrilled to be joining the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. It's a privilege to be preaching with you today, and I'm coming to you from Church of the Resurrection Sanctuary in, the, in Leewood, Kansas, a suburb of Kansas City, and uh, sharing with our congregation as well, so simultaneously preaching to two congregations. And uh, Church of the Resurrection, like the National Cathedral, uh, there's no one in our building right now, just a handful of people helping with the recording of this service. It's an honor to be sharing the word with you, and I'm coming to you from Church of the Resurrection Sanctuary, and, I, and uh, like you, Bishop Buddy, I'm uh, speaking to an empty room, and uh, it's part of how we do worship during the COVID days, but we're coming to thousands and thousands of people online, and it's a joy to have our two congregations worshiping together today. Thank you for allowing me to be with you, and, uh, and I'm excited for us to share together in the service of worship on the very first weekend of Advent. So as we do that, I want to just mention a couple of things. This uh, sermon series at Resurrection, so Resurrection, this month we're not using the lectionary. We're focusing on, the th- on a theme called Incarnation, Rediscovering the Significance of Christmas. And each week we're looking at the various titles that were given to Jesus by the gospel writers in the accounts of the Nativity. So in Matthew and Luke's account of the birth of Christ and the events surrounding it, and in John's prologue to the gospel in John chapter 1 verses 1 through 18 and we're seeing what are these titles that were given to Jesus by the gospel writers or by the angels or by the people in the stories and then what do those what do those titles tell us about the one whose birth we're celebrating and the one we anticipate returning once again at the end of the age what do they tell us about him and then what do they tell us about ourselves how did Jesus incarnate these ideas and then how does he call us to incarnate these ideas in our own lives and in the world around us. So that's where we're heading this month. I'll just mention to you, just in case you're curious, where we're heading here at Resurrection the next few weeks. We're gonna talk about today, Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah. Next week, Jesus is Savior. The third week, Jesus is Emmanuel. The fourth week, we're gonna talk about Jesus is the Word made flesh. On Christmas Eve, we'll talk about Jesus is the light of the world. And on the Sunday after Christmas, we're gonna talk about Jesus as Lord. All of these are titles you find in the gospel stories surrounding the birth of Jesus. Today, we're going to focus on this idea of Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah, and we're going to unpack this. We're going to try to understand what does that title mean. It appears more than 500 times throughout the entire New Testament, so it's pretty important to know what did the early Christians believe when they called Jesus the Christ. And Jesus Christ, that Christ is not his last name, it actually is a title, and it has an interesting history and an interesting meaning. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, I'll just remind you, 
Christ comes from the Greek Christos. In Hebrew, the, the same word in the Hebrew language is Mashiach or Messiah. So Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. These are titles for Jesus and they mean the anointed one or actually one that has been anointed. It's a noun and it describes a person or an object that has been anointed. So when something was anointed, oil was smeared upon it uh, with a thumb or a finger. It was smeared upon the object or the person or oil was poured upon their head. And so... Uh, so this is an interesting title for Jesus. Jesus is the one who had oil smeared on him. <laughs> but there's far more to it than that. So let's just unpack a little bit of the history of this word, and then we'll begin to understand what it might mean for us today. So uh, in the book of Exodus, we read that God tells Moses to create an oil, a scented oil, and then he is to use it to anoint the objects that were used in worship in the, in the tabernacle, the, the portable temple. He was then to use that same oil to anoint the people that would become priests, Aaron and his sons. And uh, later on, the same, the same kind of oil was going to be used to anoint uh, people to be king over Israel. Not Moses wouldn't do this, but uh, Samuel would be the first to do this with Saul and then with David. But when somebody became king, they were anointed. Now here's what the anointing oil meant. It meant, uh, this was God's way of saying, this person or this object belongs to me. This person or object is sacred to me. It's set apart for my purposes. It is holy unto me. It's consecrated for my work. And so that could be true of, of objects. It could be true of people. I'm standing here above our baptismal font at Church of the Resurrection Sanctuary, and I can still see the sign of the cross. You can barely make it out in oil on the limestone when Bishop Rubin's signs uh, anointed this, this font, when he actually consecrated it uh, three years ago when our sanctuary was built. And he placed the oil on there as a way of saying, this font belongs to God, and it's to be set aside for God's purposes. He did the same thing. Bishop Signs did the same thing in, on our altar behind me. Uh, when people are, are ordained, they have oil placed upon them. In most traditions, oil placed upon them, and the bishop lays their hands on them, and they are consecrated or ordained for God's purposes. When somebody is baptized, we put oil on their head, and we invoke the Holy Spirit, and we say, this child or this adult is set apart for God's purpose, belongs to God, is sacred to God. And, and when we confirm, we do the same thing. When somebody is sick, we anoint with oil, and that oil is both a sign of the balm of Gilead, the healing of God, the Holy Spirit's presence, but also a reminder to the one who is sick, you belong to God. You are holy to God. You are God's. And may God somehow, God didn't cause this sickness, but may God use it somehow to accomplish God's purposes. And then when somebody approaches death, and I've done this many times with people in our congregation who are dying, I take the oil, I make the sign of the cross upon their forehead, and I give them to Jesus. And once more, I remind them, you belong to him. You are sacred to him. You, you, are, you are his child, and he's going to hold you from this life to the next. He's got a hold of you and won't let you go. Anointing, it's a very powerful idea. Now, as I mentioned, the kings were anointed with oil. So as they were anointed with oil, this was very important. The king was meant to understand, you rule at the pleasure of God. God is the king of the universe, our Jewish friends say. And so when we think about him as the king of the universe or the ruler of all creation, then when God allows somebody to rule as king, when he chooses them to be king, or when he allows somebody to rule as, as president or whatever the position might be in our world today, God is saying, I'm, I'm lending some of my authority to you. Now, now, you belong to me. You're meant to accomplish my purposes. I mean, that was the idea behind anointing somebody with oil. And over the centuries in Judaism, when, when the Jewish people would no longer be ruled by their own kings, when there would be nations that would destroy them, or there would be kings, foreign kings ruling over them, or they'd be taken off into bondage and exile, the prophets would speak and they would say, but the day is going to come where God's going to raise up another king. And they would paint a picture of this ideal king. He would rule with righteousness and with justice. And he would be a shepherd over God's people. And, and as he shepherded them, he would, he would bind up the wounded. He would search for the strays and bring back the lost. This is what the ideal king would look like. And the people began to long for that. Sometimes they had their own kings, but they didn't measure up to this. And they kept praying and longing for a king that God would raise up who would, who would be like this ideal king the prophet spoke about. And that takes us to the time of Jesus. And in this time, of course, the Romans ruled over the, the Holy Land, the Promised Land, and their client king was Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was no Messiah. He was no anointed one. He didn't, he didn't live up to the great ideals that the prophets had laid out, neither did the emperor in Rome. And so the people were longing, waiting, hoping for the coming of this anointed one, this king. So when we talk about Jesus as the Christ, the term 500 times in the New Testament refers to the fact that he is the ruler who was promised of old. He is the one who would rule and reign after God's own heart. And, and when we look at him, we recognize that Christians don't simply believe that Jesus was sent by God like any other person to be a king, but that he actually incarnated God's presence. He embodied God's presence in our world with us. That's a mystery we can't fully explain. But the fact that God came to us in Jesus, born in Bethlehem as a babe, grew up to be a man who suffered and died for us and was raised to life 
in order to show us who God is and who we are called to be and what it means to be human and to redeem and save this broken world. That's who Jesus is. That's our king. Now, at Advent, of course, we're preparing ourselves to rightly celebrate his birth and to remember something about his story and, and, and to remember the longing of the prophets and the, and the words that they spoke about what this king would be like and, and to remember once more why we need him. So this whole season, this whole month is about yearning and longing and remembering and, and so we can rightly celebrate you know, we can really fully remember the significance of Christmas. But we're also remembering that Jesus said he would come back one day. He would come back at the end of the age. And so we anticipate that. And, and if it's not the end of the age, it certainly will be at the end of our lives. So Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back for you. I love that. He doesn't say he'll send the angels. He says, I will come back for you. His second advent may very well be when he comes back for you. And when he comes back for me, and I want to be ready for that. And I want you to be ready for that moment where when he looks at you and he welcomes you into his eternal kingdom, he can say to you and say to me, you know, I think you got it right. I'm really grateful for the ways that you sought to serve me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Now, I want us to think carefully about what we find in the scriptures about Jesus as the Christ. So uh, remember, of course, that the, uh, that the first verse in Matthew's gospel names Jesus as the Christ. The first verse, I believe, in Mark's gospel names Jesus as the Christ. When we get to Luke's gospel, we read on the night when the angel, on the night Jesus was born, the angel shows up to the shepherds, keeping watch over their flock by night. And this is what he says. Don't be afraid. Look, I bring you good news. I bring good news to you. Wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. When the angel Gabriel came to Mary six or nine months earlier, when he, when he appeared to her at the Annunciation, he, he told her that she was going to give birth to a child. And then this is what he says about that child. He says, he will rule on the throne of his ancestor, David. You remember when the Magi came after Jesus was born? They came from Persia and they brought their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They show up in Jerusalem trying to find this child. And you remember the question they ask? Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. Nathaniel, when Jesus began his public ministry, Jesus begins to speak to him as teaching Nathaniel. And, and Nathaniel says this, he says, you are the king of Israel. You, you may remember, of course, when Jesus is in the midst of his ministry and he takes the disciples up to the north. And, uh, and when he's up by, by the, in the northern area at Caesarea or near Caesarea uh, Philippi, uh, he turns to the disciples, he says, who do you say that I am? Like, you know, I know what the crowds say, but who do you say that I am? And do you remember? Only Peter had the courage to speak up. And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the anointed one, the long-awaited king who is to come. That's who we believe you are. As Jesus rode into uh, Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, you remember he mounted a donkey. And people recognized that as a sign from the prophet Zechariah who said, behold, your king comes to you riding on a donkey. And so they began to throw their cloaks down before him and they waved their, their palm branches or their, or their leafy branches. And they began to shout out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, that week, uh, that the end of that week, he's on Thursday, Monday, Thursday, he's celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples. He's eating the Passover Seder with his disciples. And you remember what his disciples are arguing about? Which one of us is going to sit next to him when he comes into his kingdom? Right? And, and then Pontius Pilate, after he's arrested, you remember the question he asks? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' response, it is, as you say, a kind of cryptic response. When Jesus is crucified, you remember, he's already been anointed, not by the high priest, but by three different women in the Gospels, one of whom was known as the sinful woman of the town. And these are the people that anointed Jesus. When, when he's coronated, you remember the Roman soldiers take a crown of thorns and they place it upon his brow. They, they, they install him on his throne by hanging him on a cross. And you remember the sign above his head? Jesus of Nazareth. What? King of the Jews. All right, that's our king. When we look at this story, that is our king. You remember the New Testament throughout the epistles, the, the, the name that's most commonly used for Jesus by Paul is he's the Christ, right? Or Lord is the other one, Christ or Lord. And when you get to the very end of the New Testament, you get to the book of Revelation and, and this, this final scene in Revelation sees Jesus. He's got a crown upon his, heads, upon his head and, and it's said that he had written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's our king. Now, it's interesting as we're in the season of Advent that we're thinking about uh, Jesus as king on this first weekend of Advent against the backdrop of an election, right? A very divisive election, a polarizing election. That, that's the way they've been for years, but, but even worse this year. 
And, and if you had the opportunity to go to someone's house for Thanksgiving, you may have stayed away from conversations about politics unless you agree. And, and actually for many people, it was a blessing that they socially distanced at Thanksgiving so they didn't have to talk about politics because this has divided communities. It's divided, uh, it's divided churches, faith communities, Sunday school classes where people no longer will talk to each other because they held differing views, supported different candidates for the office of president and, and families who are divided. I've, I've talked to people who, who won't even talk to their family members or whose family members won't talk to them anymore because of who they supported in the election. This passion and the division in our country was seen in the amazing response to the election, the number of people who came out to vote. So we set records, as you may know, 156 million Americans voted last time I checked. That was 65.4% of eligible voters. We haven't seen that kind of uh, election uh, results, the number of people voting among the eligible, 65.4% since 1908. You know, people came out in mass numbers voting for their candidate. And, and part of what we saw in those numbers, uh, we saw President Trump had 10 million more votes than he had uh, four years ago. 10 million more votes, and yet he still lost the election. There were people who came out who didn't come out before to support him. And then there were lots and lots of people who came out over 80 million, 74 million, around 74 million for President Trump, uh, just over 80 million for, for President-elect Biden who came out. And they were determined to not have him as their president. Some came out determined to have him. Some came out determined not to have him, but instead to have President-elect Biden. I mean, this is the kind of, you know, passion and anger and angst and frustration and fear that generates so many people coming out to vote in this election. Even now, CNBC change research poll uh, found that 73% of President Trump's voters believe he actually won the election. Right? That's really hard when a large number of people believe that, that the person who didn't win did win. And 81% of President Trump's supporters they surveyed said that they wouldn't give President-elect Biden a chance. And how do we move forward as a country like that? But before the Democrats start pointing fingers at Republicans, I'm pretty sure the numbers weren't too different four years ago when President Trump was elected and uh, Hillary Clinton was not elected. I'm pretty sure a lot of those Clinton voters said, I'm never going to give this guy a chance and believe that he didn't rightfully win the election. I mean, you know, it's just interesting how, how, how divided we are as a country. And in the end, the brokenness that brings, the pain that brings to families, communities, the inability to solve problems, and the opportunity for pain and brokenness and evil to fester in our midst. As I was reading the Gospels during this election, there were several things that stood out to me. So uh, it, it's interesting when every single day the top story in the news, or, or almost every day the top story on the news is the elections, you start thinking about everything in these terms. So I was reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John this year, and as I was reading the Gospels, what struck me is that Jesus' ministry looked very much like a campaign. Right? He, he was coming and he knew that he was king. Uh, he saw himself as the Christ, I believe. And, uh, and his disciples saw him that way. So his campaign finance team were a group of women who funded the campaign. Right? Uh, the, although the one man was the treasurer, that was Judas Iscariot, who was stealing from the kitty. Th then we have, uh, after that, his, his campaign officers, and those were the 12 disciples. And you remember, they were jockeying for position, wondering which one of them would get to serve on what part of his cabinet once he became king. That's what they were all anticipating. Right? And, and so Jesus comes and, and he begins to speak and he's giving these campaign rallies with thousands of people who are showing up. And as he's preaching and teaching at these campaign rallies, what he's laying out is his platform, his vision for what the kingdom, well, he called it the kingdom of God, what the world should look like. And that he said was the reign of God, the kingdom of God. And, and so he lays this out and he begins preaching and teaching this. If you want to know what his platform looked like, look at the Sermon on the Mount where he lays this out clearly. You know, the first two Portions of that are, we need to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, and then that included even loving your enemies. And then again, in the Sermon on the Mount, we find things like the call to, to be honest, and to be faithful, and to be humble, and to be selfless, and to forgive other people. I mean, all of these are sort of the, the principal virtues of the kingdom, and, and they're at center of how he would run the country, right? How he would rule the world is in these ways, with these values, and then he illustrates those values. He, he sort of makes, you know, puts flesh on them by telling stories. He tells parables. And, and so when he's telling the parables, he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. He says, listen, this is what my kingdom looks like if it's, if it's realized here. Uh, and he talks about a man who sees somebody who's left for dead on the side of the road. And, he, and, and even though they're, they're, they're not blood brothers, one's a Samaritan, one's a Jew, he stops to help. And he takes off his cloak and he pays for his medical treatment and, and provides for him. Right? He says, that's what it's supposed to look like. And then he tells the parable of the sheep and the goats. And, and you know the story. He talks about at the last day, this is how judgment's going to go down. And, and God's going to bless those who fed the hungry, 
who gave drink to the thirsty, who clothed the naked, who welcomed the foreigner, those who visited the prisons and cared for the prisoners and those who cared for the sick. Right? These are core values of the kingdom. And Jesus is saying, this is what I'm expecting of you. This is what, I've, this is what you're going to be held accountable to at the last judgment. Right? So Jesus comes and he preaches this way. He teaches this way. He lives this way. So what struck me was, you know, Advent coming three to four weeks after the election, every presidential election, Advent comes three or four weeks afterwards. And I wondered, is it possible that Advent comes at this time and that that is providential? 75% of Americans claim to be Christians, claim to be followers of the Christ, the anointed one. And as followers of Christ, what would happen if we actually looked to Jesus and his values and virtues as the driving force in our lives? What if the 75% of us, Republicans and Democrats and Independents, Green Party and whatever else, what if we all said, you know what, there, we had different candidates for the presidency, but we have one king. And because you share the same king as I share, we are brothers and sisters. And we're going to try to live according to his values and figure out it within our own political ideologies. How do we live into these values? How do we become the people he wants us to be? Because that is our king. The day after the inauguration, every four years, the National Cathedral hosts a service called the inaugural service, the National Inaugural Service or the National Prayer Service. And uh, George Washington started this, not at the National Cathedral, it didn't exist then, but George Washington instituted this on his first full day in office where he wanted the clergy to pray for him. He wanted the prayers of the nation. And, and then it, most of the presidents since then have done this. Since 1933, every president has participated in the National Inaugural Service, and most of those have done this at the National Cathedral. I had the privilege of preaching one of those services for President Obama in his second inauguration, the only time I preached from your pulpit at the National Cathedral. And, and here's what I was thinking to myself. You know, all of these pastors and leaders have come. There's, there's the president and the, and the first lady and the vice president and, and his wife. There are, uh, there are Supreme Court justices and Congress people and all of these, you know, leaders of our, of our country. And, and I'd spent hours rewriting this sermon over and over again. And all I could think of was, God, what do you want to say to this man as he steps into this role once more for four more years. And inside what I longed for, and, and I think what we were praying for, you know, as, as people who were gathered there, was that he might rule, that he might preside, understanding that his authority ultimately came from God and from the people, but ultimately God has allowed him in this role, and that he might seek to live the virtues and the values that Jesus espoused when he talked about the kingdom of God. And I think probably everyone who's ever prayed for a president and, and given the message at one of those was longing for, hoping that that would happen. This is what I long for for our next president, that as he goes to that service, the National Cathedral, he will walk out saying, I desperately want to live these values and virtues that have shaped my life. And then they might set the pace for all the rest of us. Now, presidents are not perfect. They're human beings, fallible, faulty human beings. They don't have it all figured out. They don't have it all right. They need our prayers. They need our help. Sometimes they need our encouragement. Sometimes they need our criticism. But their job is to preside, to rule, to lead on behalf of the king of kings, the ruler of the universe. That's how I see it. All right, so with that in mind, I, I want to wrap this up by saying on this first weekend of Advent that, um, that Jesus is meant to be our king, our ruler, our sovereign Right? And, and we're preparing to celebrate his birth and we're anticipating his coming again. And, and as, I, as I want to leave you, I, I, want to, I want to leave you with the message, a sermon that was preached by a man named S.M. Lockridge. S.M. Lockridge was a very famous preacher in the, tw in the 20th century. Uh, he was, uh, led an African-American congregation, was a uh, missionary and evangelist. He loved leading people to follow Jesus Christ, but he was also a civil rights leader and was passionate about racial justice. And he preached a sermon in his life that was called, his title for it was Amen. And it was preached, it was an hour-long sermon, it was preached across the country, and uh, his most famous sermon, and the last six minutes really redefined what that sermon was about. It was what people were longing to hear, and, uh, and gave it the popular name, That's My King. We've taken a couple minutes from that sermon, and I want you to hear it, and I want you to listen to his question. Take a listen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. 
He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent, and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. That's my king. And every week, you know, when I get up to preach and every day when I try to lead this congregation, my hope is to help him become your king, is for you to see him and to say, I want to follow him. I want him to be my king. I want to, I want to go where he wants me to go, do what he wants me to do, live according to his platform, his values, his virtues, his ideals. I want to be a part of his kingdom. That's my hope and prayer for you. When Jesus came preaching, and I want to wrap it up with this one, Jesus came preaching in Mark's gospel. It says this was, this was his first sermon. It was very short. He says, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives. In other words, repent and trust this good news. As we're preparing for celebrating Christmas and readying ourselves for the second coming of our king, I want to ask you, do you have anything to repent of? And I actually know you do. I know there are places you need to change your heart and your mind. As, as Republicans, as Democrats, as Independents, whatever you might be, in the political realm, we've messed things up. In our daily lives, we get it wrong. And for us to be able to say, Lord, please forgive me. Help me to be the person you want me to be. I want to follow you. That is my hope for you. Every morning I wake up, I get on my knees, I say the same thing. Here I am, Jesus. I belong to you. Use me however you will. Do with me what you want. I'm yours. Put me to, to work for your purposes. That's what I want your prayer to be. Now listen, if we were in person, I mean, this is how I envision the service ending if we were actually in this room and there were people filling all the seats like pre-COVID, is I would at this moment invite you to stand and to come forward if you wanted to follow Jesus as your king. I would invite you to come forward. We would have at the communion stations, instead of communion, we would have pastors there with anointing oil. And you leaning forward and them taking the, the, the oil and, and with their thumb making the sign of the cross on your forehead as a way of saying, as a way for you to say, I surrender myself to Christ. I want to follow him. And when they place that oil on your forehead for you to feel that and for you to say, I belong to you, Jesus. For you to know you belong to him that he's washed you and, and that he's setting you aside for his purposes. 
But we can't do that here. So earlier in the service, you may have heard, we invited you to get oil. If you have olive oil, put it on a little plate, just a little dab of it, or, or be able to put it on your finger. If you have vegetable oil, that's fine. If you have scented oil, if you have lotion, lotion is fine. Doesn't matter. If you don't have anything, I just want you to use your thumb and imagine that it's there. And here's what I want you to do. I have the anointing oil we use to anoint children who've been baptized and adults who've been baptized. I want you to just dip your finger ever so carefully in that oil or your lotion, or just imagine it's there, and I want you to make the sign of the cross on your forehead. And I want you to bow in prayer with me. Would you whisper these words to the Lord? Say them out loud if you like. Jesus, I belong to you. Anoint me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me. Forgive me. Form me and shape me. Make me the person you want me to be. Help me to follow you, to love you, and to serve you. Help me to live as an anointed one, set apart for your purposes. And use me, I pray, in your holy name. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon. We'd love for you to join us again online or live in worship. To learn more about Church of the Resurrection, please visit core.org. Have a great week.